Hi, my name's Darren Neal. And I'm Pompey. And this is the Classic Superbike Show. Hi, and welcome to the Classic Superbike Show. So, uh, we made it, Pomps. Yeah. It's taken us a oh. few weeks to get oh. together. It's been oh, uh, a know. few false starts to get this second episode recorded. Yeah. Uh, but here we are. We are we are in the midst of recording a second episode for you. Yeah. Uh, and while on that subject, I want to thank everybody that took the time to watch the last show. Uh, we actually expected to... Uh, how many people do you think we expected to, to watch it, Pomps? Well, your missus and a couple of my mates and... <laughs> <laughs> so about four. So yeah. we expected we'd be yeah. talking basically to ourselves, my wife, uh, hi Laura, and, um, and a couple of Pompey's <laughs> yeah. mates. But actually, 672 mm. yeah. people today have watched the show, and we yeah. are really grateful for that. So thank yeah. you very much indeed. Um, so on to today's show. So today, mm. what have we got for you? So coming up very soon, we've got a lovely a little retrospective piece on a classic 80s and 90s brand, uh, Bimota. Mm. Uh, we've got our bike of the show. And uh, yeah, we're actually going to get story time in this time as well. Yeah. We promised it last time, but uh, I've managed to make up something. Uh, I mean, uh, remember something from the past, <laughs> yeah. and uh, we're going to have a little story time. Unfortunately, there's no riders' wives. I know some of you were looking forward to the riders' wives. Remember, that's bikes, not actual wives. Um, but we haven't had any sent in. So remember, next time, make sure you send in your riders' wives. That's twin yeah. headlight bikes, black tape. You'll get a reminder later in the show. Good. What have you been up to? Well, uh, I've been waiting for this endless winter to finish yeah, so is, we can get out and get some tedious, riding done. It? I mean, it it's tedious, tedious. but, uh, you know, working on different projects during lockdown and, and doing this, looking forward to it, working on the bikes, looking forward to getting out on the road. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it is endless winter, isn't it? And yeah. It's chucking it down out there now. We yeah. were hoping to get the bikes out and ride them for you this show, but um, as we've had three or four false starts at recording, we thought we'd best just get on with it. Yeah, and absolutely. And getting on with it, good point, right to that point. So. Let's get on with it. With no more ado, we give you Bimota. Bimota, a name that stirs the soul. Some of us maybe have never actually seen one in the flesh, and yet during the 80s and 90s, this tiny Italian company made some of the most iconic bikes of the era. Bimota was formed, like all the best things, <clears throat> in 1973 by legendary designers Valerio Bianchi, Giuseppe Mori and Massimo Tamburini. And using the first two letters of each of their surnames, they came up with the name Bimota. Throughout the 80s and 90s, they took Japanese and Italian engines and put them in beautiful chassis while liberating the engines of any pesky restrictions imposed by the then Gentleman's Agreement on engine output. So bikes like this beautiful YB10 based on Yamaha's FZR 1000X up came into existence. I mean, just look at it, it's stunning. From an investment point of view, you can't really go wrong with an 80s or 90s Bimota. This YB10 featured sold for just under 10K only this year, so they are still affordable, just. But with only very small numbers of each machine ever made, the values are only going one way. Sadly, the golden era of this legendary company came to an end when the mainstream manufacturers got their acts together and started producing bikes like the Honda Fireblade, Yamaha R1 and Ducati 916. But Bimota's time in the sun certainly produced some stunners. Just take a look at this beautiful YB10 Diecci. Bimota there. I mean, I've only ever seen two Bimotas in real life. The one I was talking about in the video there, and the other one was a YB4, which belonged yeah, to me. Pompey. So yeah. tell me, Pompey, tell me about the ownership experience. Do you know, I've had a lot of them, and I, I'm, I love the look of them. I love the feel. I love what they represent in design. Um, 
I had DB2 was my first one, and SB6s. Uh, I had so the SB6s, the Suzuki, Suzuki. 2600 yeah. engine. Could, so you so. can always tell with the with the the B motors. So the the name of the bike will be the engine donor will be the first letter. Then it will always be a B for B motor, and then it'll be a number to denote which line of the designs they've gone through. So I mean, so if you could, DB1 was one that I had, and I wish I kept. Now, do you know what? This is a funny thing. I wish I kept them all. Yeah, obviously, we, we've all got. I wish I kept them all, but the thing is, uh, you're not going to get uh, every every bike is oh, my favourite, and everything's right. I do wish I kept them, but to, to be honest, living with them, I was quite happy the day I sold it as well they are so frustrating <laughs> they you know they're di they are frustrating but beautiful and, and beautiful. very collectible but yeah, yeah. frustrating as an ownership yeah. experience if you want to actually use it if you want to stick it in your lounge polish it and you know yeah. love it then yeah that's fine but you want yeah, to ride it sb6 i've got to say i had three of them and actually a couple of my friends have got like a couple them, oh my goodness i mean that that gsx r 1100 tuned and it was just when it was running right on and it was feeling good it was just beautiful but if you had to adjust the wing mirror you had to take the engine out i mean it was anything any anything to do with spannering on it engine out strip it back down to just to do the most basic things yeah it was very frustrating it's a very uh, all-in design concept isn't it? Yeah, yeah 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 and miles ahead of the time monocoque you know use of carbon fiber they were simple and um beautiful to look at Wonderful to ride when they're right, frustrating when they're not. But uh, never, if you get one, never sell one. I mean, they went down yeah, the, the two-stroke route, didn't they, with the um, yeah. Bidu? Bidu. Bidu, yeah. Injected. Yeah, injected two-stroke, wow. Wrong. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong there? Yeah. And did. And did, and so did everybody took the injection so off and it. put carbs on it. Yeah, and they pretty much all went back. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. But uh, then, of course, they had their hub centre steered bike, the yeah. uh, Tessie, Tessie, Tessie 1D, um, which, again, absolutely avant-garde. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, not afraid to try things. I mean, a, a fantastic brand and very much of the era that, that we yeah. are talking about, yeah. really, very much so. And talking of bikes of that era mm. and multi-ship, multi multi-ship, multiple ownership experiences. Oh, I'm so glad you did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's move on to our bike of the show. Mm. As you know, every every show we have a new bike of mm. the show, although it's not a new bike, it's a very old one. Um, and this, this week it's uh, one of my personal favourites. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Kawasaki ZX-7R Ninja. So on to this show's bike of the show, uh, and this time I am delighted to say that it's one of my all-time favourites, the Kawasaki ZX-7R Ninja. This is one of the, well, it's the only bike I've ever bought new. It was 1997, I had it a month and I smashed it to bits, but more on that later. The two bikes we've got here obviously are in the traditional Kawasaki green. One's done very much as a race bike, one is a road bike, and we believe they're both 1998 bikes. We're not quite sure, the colours, uh, they, they kept changing them yeah. so often between the years of production of 1996 and 2003 that uh, to be honest we're getting on a bit and we can't remember yeah so Pompey I mean talk to me about these bikes I mean these are your bikes um, yeah. again thanks very much um, so just tell me I mean this one obviously Chris Walker replica yeah uh, this one's a road bike yeah and this one's a road bike both um, mm, not completely different to ride but their characteristics stays the same whether in road trim or in race trim Kawasaki I mean it, Completely different to last time with the RC30, which was refined, finely tuned, slimmed down, pared down, small, polite, exquisite. Kawasaki, no way. Completely different beast. You know, the Kawasaki, uh, uh, the owner of the Kawasaki firm, named after the city he was born in, Kawasaki, between Tokyo and Yokohama. It's an industrial town like Detroit, Michigan, where the big motors came from. And that's exactly what these bikes are like. Un they, they're built around the strong engine. The refinement isn't great. 
in their day they were fairly heavy but that helped them feel confident in the corners it gave them that feeling of grip at lower speeds because you had that extra downforce i always and remember they had an amazing front end ah, I mean, they, they, they yeah. sounded great really yeah. quite agricultural raw power delivery yeah. i mean you can tell that cows like you make engines for ships yeah. um but yeah. just the, the front end <laughs> yeah. was pretty, just stuck Man. to the road and they scream and you want to rev them they rev high you know, out to 12,000 revs and they scream at you. And they just, they just, the gearing is very different again to the Honda RC30. It's not long for front first gear. It, just, it makes you feel confident. It makes you want to ride a bike. They are stunning in every way. And they change colors for sure, but that's the only thing they changed. Throughout the whole period, really, there was very few tweaks. Didn't really need it. I thought it was a fantastic no. bike. I mean, it rode no. brilliant. I still think they ride brilliantly. I mean, I've actually owned two of them. I had yeah. a, a track one as well, and yeah. as well as a new one. I think I managed to do three and a half thousand miles in a month yeah. on my road one before I smashed it to smithereens. <laughs> um, yes. Well, well, there you go. It does happen. It does to me quite mm. often. Um, but these bikes, I absolutely love them. I think they are the best looking Japanese motorcycles yeah. You know, and back ever. in a, back in a time when you could see a you know, a silhouette of a bike on the horizon, you didn't know which bike it was because of the way it looked. These look beautiful in a pit bull, ugly kind of way. They had their, they've got their own look. They, when you get on them, they feel like you're on a, on a proper bike. They were okay, so the 750 class may have been overtaken during this period with the 600s, which were just as fast, light, agile, and obviously the thousand cc bikes which actually became smaller and lighter and more agile and more powerful but they none of them had the feel of these things oh, i just remember yeah the world superbike days you yeah. know you, you got oh. uh anthony gober yanagawa uh, kiri yanagawa chris oh. walker yeah you know to name to name a few and, and yeah. just these things just sideways everywhere i mean okay they were 850s but whatever let's yeah. not hold that against them yeah yeah uh they they really took it to the to Ducati and, and they looked fantastic didn't yeah they? i mean i always rooted for the kawasaki yeah and Whoever they invented rear wheel steering Whoever was riding it i always wanted them to do well on it um just a phenomenal motorcycle so i mean get let's get to the detail of the bikes i mean this this one here it's a chris walker replica yep. um it's very much a track bike registered for the road um so i mean just tell us what this one's got you know over that one for instance Bob. well the power the power delivery of the engine is so good I, there's not much done to the engine other to, other than to have an, an open air box and a race full race system on it um, the gearing is, is the same. I like that gearing. It's, I've got it into race shift. Uh, the, the suspension is different. I've raised the back end to improve the, the turn in. Whilst you had the, you've got rock solid stability. And that was quite a popular mod on these yeah. back in the day. Yeah, you know, it was so pretty was standard. Uh, but once you get going, they're, they're fine. When, you, when, you, when I jump off some of the bikes I've gotten onto this, it feels, until you're tuned into it, especially on the track, you feel you're on a big bike. But yeah, you know, in the same token, you can surprise an awful lot of people. And, Absolutely, and, yeah. You know, Absolutely, and it, you its rival was what the Fireblade when, fire when it came yeah. out. Yeah. But the Fireblade, you couldn't race. Yep. And on the road, most riders in reality would be quicker on this than absolutely on the five would. yeah absolutely well, this yeah. is more powerful than the first yeah. five yeah, yeah so uh i mean just looking at this very quickly i can see that we've got the uh, the rental race grips i mean you've got the bar and mirror to make it easier to ride on the road we've got a, uh, a race dash with no speedo um although there is a sort of digital kind of you know yeah. uh, add-on speedo there again for the road to get through an mot uh, we've got carbon fiber air intakes so if you can pick those out on the video probably not uh we've got the acro can uh and then obviously the single seat unit which i think just makes it look brilliant like i see a set of rear sets on yeah. there as well just nice and the only shot which which makes it you know a much much better ride on the track and as i say having ridden one on the track i can't yeah. say they're great fun they really are yeah. i mean you need the back jacked up because you run out of ground clearance really really quickly if yeah. you don't um but the front end's phenomenal and they are fast i mean genuinely 170 plus miles an hour you know that's quick that yeah, is yeah. quick uh, and then you know they are good value at the moment they are good value unbelievable i mean yeah. for the value you can get these they're at a point as we discussed last week or last time where they're at a point where they can, they're never going to get any cheaper surely i mean they are so good if they're if they're looked after or if they are brought back from the brink of rust hell they're a great bike you know mm. and they and people are going to actually reminisce get back into them and understand what it's like to ride a bike that you're riding. Your, your input is actually what the bike There's no does. rider aids, there's no ABS, no, no, there's no, no, no traction no. control, there's none no. of that. You are it. Your right hand is the controlling feature on these motorcycles. So, funny story, um, 
I could have actually bought this bike. You could. Before Pompey bought it, yeah. uh, I could have bought this bike. I could have bought this bike for £1,200, yeah. which is Wait, ridiculous. That. This is me kicking myself <laughs> yeah. really quite hard. Um, this bike now um, it is getting on for £4,000 worth of motorcycle. They are starting to appreciate. They are yeah. finally starting to come good in the market. So if you're after a Kawasaki ZX-7R, Now's the time. It kind of yeah. is now, isn't it? Because they yeah. are creeping up, and, and what a bike. They are absolutely phenomenal. And uh, I, for one, I mean, I absolutely love them. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And if, you, and if, you're, in a, if you're in the mood for something that gives you that old-time classic feel, I, this would be my go-to bike. It, it is a bike for all people, all seasons, road, track, touring. They are fantastic. I mean, you sit in it, you've got that... Yeah. low down clip on handlebar position yeah. it gives you all the feel in the world it, it's just a phenomenal thing a great bike to ride and like i said really fast yeah so um yeah ladies and gentlemen the kawasaki zx7r ninja and now back to the rest of the show zx7r ninja there and i have massively fond memories of my two that i had um yeah. But seriously guys, I mean, we covered most of this off in the video there, but if you are looking at getting involved in the 750cc market in general, not just the Kawasaki, uh, you need to get in now. Those prices are starting to skyrocket. As I said in the video, I could have bought that bike down there for £1,200. It's now up for sale for just under £4,000, mm. and it's only three or four years ago. Um, but those 750s, get involved now. Isn't that right, Pops? Yeah, I mean, they appreciate because they're starting to be appreciated. Uh, you know, they're... That whole 750 uh, mark for a bike, it's so sad, that period that they, they were lost to us. You know, there was, they were clung on, the ZX-7s clung on, the Suzuki clung on. But the they Suzuki, only stopped making that three years yeah, ago. Yeah, and they, but they had to, to keep it there, they had to keep changing, modifying, changing, modifying, and making it a wonderful motorcycle. But the fact that they stopped racing 750s once they changed, Ducati got the rule changed, and it kind of killed off the 750s as a as, as a choice, a weapon of choice. They weren't the old race. adage, old adage, isn't it? Race on right. Sunday, so on, on Monday. Monday, and you know, which is sad because for an average rider, you, there's nothing better than the 750. They've got the. It's just a wonderful feeling, and, and specifically, but maybe especially the ZX7, because to get the best out of it, and to get the best feel of it, out of it, you have to ride it well. It's a bike that wants you to ride it well. It wants you to feel like you're a world superbike legend you want to be in the right gear you want to be up in the rev range you want to be blipping down the throttle hearing it scream oh, and wailing doing it now and oh, oh this is taking God. me back and it's ethereal i mean it makes you feel great and the bike won't let you down you, you can you'll you'll think the engine's going to blow up and it's just, it just only just going warming up and going and going yeah. and just just revs and revs, revs just keeps going yeah so if you're honestly if you're, if you're in the market for a, getting a, a, a proper motorbike that can do anything on, just do it now, do it, do it quick. I mean, plus we're all getting old and, well, there is and your feet won't reach yeah. the rear sets. You'd only fit on it for a few more years, to be fair. Yeah, so, yeah. GSX-R750, YZF750, ZX7R, yeah. Yeah. go and get involved now. You won't regret it, yeah. loads of fun. Yeah. And uh, yeah, all the fun you'll ever need to be perfectly honest. So I'm gonna move on a bit now. Yep. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we had no entries at all for riders' wives. Um, so I feel it's only uh, important now that I remind you to get those entries into us. You can uh, email them in. Uh, probably best to email them to me, darren.n at motorcyclesuk.co.uk. That's darren.n at motorcyclesuk.co.uk. Love to see your bikes. Remember, black tape across the headlights, please, in the manner of the gentlemen's mm. magazines. Um, and that's got to be twin round headlights. So we're looking for GSX-R 750s. I'll take a ZX-7R, but preferably a ZX-R 750. Yeah. Um, even maybe a YZF 750, maybe. Yeah. FZR 600, early FZR 1000, early Fireblade. Yeah, the YZF was the connoisseur's bike, wasn't it? It was. It was the posh so. people who had YZF. Yeah, posh, he used to have one of those as well. <laughs> <laughs> posh people, uh, YZF. But yeah, riders' wives, get them in. Yellow so screen. Now, yellow screen. Yellow screen. What happened to yellow screens? Purple screens. Ugh. And it, oh. <laughs> That was very much of the period, <laughs> wasn't it? It was all a very purple oh, yeah. period, very, wasn't it? Was I blame Prince. I bet, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. So, last time we promised a story. Uh, I know you're all probably looking forward to it, sat there in your pyjamas with your teddy bears waiting for that bedtime story. But well, it's coming. We couldn't think of anything. Um, actually, we've run out of time. This time, we have got story time. So, coming up, it's story time. And as I said before, it's, it's a doozy. A doozy. 
Once upon a time, there was a young motorcyclist. Let's call him Darren. Hello, Darren. And one sunny bank holiday Sunday, he finished his job at Motorcycle City. Remember them? <laughs> and went for a ride on his trusty ZX7R. Fortunately, for reasons that will become apparent, our hero had the good sense to pop home and put his leathers on before heading out from Harlow to Colchester. The sun was shining and all was right with the world as he blasted along the country roads on the jet black ninja. After a short coffee stop, it was time to head home. And our hero was not taking any prisoners and no horses were to be spared. In the distance, he spotted the rear end of an Aprilia RS250, a fine scalp indeed. Although the 250 couldn't match the mighty 7R for top speed, it was a worthy adversary. Due to its nimble handling and the fact that it weighed about the same as a bag of sugar, game on. The tin boxes between the two bikes flashed past as if they were standing still and the ninja was soon upon its prey and swiftly passed. The pilot aboard the RS was game, but the road opened up and as the Kawasaki passed 150-ish, the tiny Aprilia disappeared in the rear view mirrors. I think, couldn't actually see anything but elbows in the mirrors on a 90 sports bike of course. And our hero kept the big Kawasaki pinned, basking in the glory of another victory. But wait, what's this? A roundabout? Who put that there? Balls! As Darren tipped the 750 in, knowing there was no way he would make it, no matter how legendary the front end was. He used every available bit of road. Maybe, just maybe, he could pull it. Nope. <clears throat> ground sky, ground sky, ground sky, and the sickening sound of plastic and metal being torn asunder from the under one month old bike, and our hero ragdolling his way, fortunately, between the upright poles and under the chevron board, and then onto the roundabout island itself. The bike destroying itself and landing some 30 to 40 meters away. As he came to a stop, Darren realized that he couldn't breathe. He hoped he was merely winded, and this proved to be the case, when with a sudden rush of air, his lungs refilled, and there before him was the beleathered figure of his vanquished foe, the 250 pilot, who, with not a hint of smugness, called an ambulance, recovery for the stricken Kawasaki, which was now the size of a mini moto, and accompanied our hero to the hospital where Darren stayed for four days. The moral of the story, dear readers, to finish first, first you must finish. So there you go. We said we'd have tales of daring do. Yeah. And indeed we did. Yes, it was a tale of woe well, and yes. warning to all those <laughs> chaps who go too fast on the road. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Yes. Yes, behave yourselves. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's uh, show two in the back. Yes. Well, I've had a lot of fun. I don't know about you. Yeah. Fantastic. And we hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you have, remember to uh, like and subscribe. And uh, as the kids say, comment down below. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure you lot do. We're also on Instagram uh, at the Classic Superbike Show. Uh, give us a follow. And if you enjoyed it, tell your friends. Uh, we'll be back in uh, probably a month or so, I would think, if we can get together again. Yeah, and we'll have sooner. yet more classic superbikes. Yeah. Pick a bike. Pick a bike. Yeah, let us know what you want to see. Yeah. Let us know what you want to see. Actually, comment down below and let us know what you want to see. Yeah. So thanks very much for watching, guys. We really appreciate it. As I said, tell your friends if you've enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you next time. Keep on the great stuff. <laughs> <laughs>